Welcome everyone. I'm your host, Carrie Wilt of The Well-Tended Life, and I am a speaker, writer, and heart cultivator who is on a mission to help you grow through anything. I am here today with my special guest, Rosie Allison, who has graciously agreed to be a part of this new series called Our Secret Garden Stories, which will feature many of those who have brought to life the new Secret Garden movie. I am so excited, I can't even see straight. So welcome, Rosie. Thank you for being a part of this today. Thank you so much, Kerry, for, for having me on and uh, really just such a pleasure and a privilege to meet you for the first time. We've corresponded a little bit, but- um, Yes. We, uh, you know, Francis Hodge Burnett, your, your kin, uh, yeah. we're, we're such admirers and lovers of her work. Well, uh, let's dig in really quick. Like, let's just get into the meat of it. Tell me who you are and um, what role you had within the making of the film. Well, I'm a, I'm a producer at a company, a British filmmaking company called Heyday Films. And and I'm I'm um, one of the producers of the film. I'm 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 really the the primary producer. I've produced with my um, uh, with my boss David Heyman, who's produced many films like Gravity and Harry Potter, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Um, but I suppose this was very particularly um, my special interest, and so uh, this has been more my baby than his. Although we're producing together. I love it. Tell me about your original relationship with the book, The Secret Garden, because this, this is one of the very first stories you told me when we spoke on the phone, gosh, maybe two years ago? Has, it, has, it, has this process been this long? Um, yeah, probably longer than that. I think, I think we first started talking about it in 2014 or something. Or right. So. It was right after you, you um, uh, announced that Colin Firth would be in the film. It was right around that time and you, you hadn't begun filming yet, but um, I tell, tell people about your relationship with the secret garden. I can't remember what I told you, but, oh. um, uh, but I, I suppose uh, it's, I have quite a personal relationship with the secret garden really just because um, I myself, when I was eight, I was sent away to, to boarding school in Yorkshire. So I ended up in one of these, you know, big old, um, strange mansions in the, in the literally in the North Yorkshire Moors, my own Misslethwaite Manor, um, and I had lovely parents, and I wasn't an orphan, but my parents were were very distant. You know, they were away, and I was away at boarding school and not seeing them for a long time. And uh, yes, it was while I was there that I saw I saw the film, um, the black and white 1949 film, which I loved the sort of creeping around in corridors and, uh, and finding the garden. Um, you know, the, the place where I was watching it was, was wilder than that. And, um, but that drove me to the book and um, it, it's inseparable for me from, from the experience of being a child um, sent away to this big old house in Yorkshire. So it, it has a very um, strange relationship with me. It, the, I suppose the very uh, even stranger really looking back is that even when I was that age, I always, I always loved movies and I always sort of thought I wanted to, to make films. Um, and it's very strange to find many years later it going full circle and me going back to a story which echoed my own childhood. And indeed we, we ended up going back and filming quite a lot of um, some key scenes of the film in that very, in, in that house and in the grounds of really um yes so um so the sort of the the um the grounds of Misselthwaite Manor and the big plain out front and the gardens out the back where she runs around before she finds the garden that's all filmed at the the school I mean it's no longer a school where um, where I was running around when I was between eight and twelve, so it's uh, it's very close to my heart, obviously, in a in a strange way. Isn't it amazing how you were equipped for the role that you're in today? You know, so long ago, those those seeds were planted, 
um, and, and how you, you were able to use them. Well, absolutely, you know, truly, because uh, what <clears throat> the, you know, the, the, there, are, there, are, there are many pains and griefs with the whole being packed off to boarding school and all the, you know, emotional deprivations of that experience, uh, which many people have written about over the years. It's not something I recommend and not something I did to my own children. But, um, but it was a very beautiful place. And I did, uh, you know, I, I, I built a very strong bond with nature at that time, uh, which has continued to be a great solace in my life. And in time of, in time of trouble, I, I have to go for a walk. You know, that's, that's where I go. I have to go for a walk in, uh, in beautiful scenery of some kind. Oh my gosh. I, I remember hanging up the phone the first time you told me this story. And I, I turned and told my husband and I was like, oh, she's the right one. She's the right one to steward this story because she feels it all the way through. Um, and I, I, just, I, I just knew um, that, that, uh, that it was in good hands with you. So it's really lovely to hear. <laughs> I love that story. Um, so talk to me about, first of all, our listeners are from all walks of life and chances are they may not even understand like what the difference is between like a producer and a director. And, and so like, how did you become a part of the film? And then kind of really, what is your, what was your role within that? Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Well, there were so many different aspects to being a producer and they're different on every film. Um, um, I, I would be what, what we would call a creative producer from the point of view that um, we, we had the idea, let's make the secret garden. And so then we reached out to writers to see if they'd be interested in adapting. And then, and in this case, the first writer we reached out to was Jack Thorne, uh, who we knew had a lovely, um, a, a very close connection with his inner child and, uh, and a lovely deep, lyrical po poetic soul and luckily he was our first approach and he immediately said I'd love to do this so then we worked with uh, Jack on the on the script and then when that felt um, when that felt ready I mean uh, we then um, searched for a director and uh, Mark Munden our director he'd been somebody I'd been I'd been meeting for over years and and trying to persuade him to do different projects. And he'd, he'd turned me down on various things actually, but he's a, he's a very particular um, director who has a, a very keen eye and everything he does is, is very, has, a, has an amazing vision to it. And he also goes very deep in the psychology and the emotional depth of the performances with his actors. And, um, and he's not at all thought of as doing things for children. So he tends to do darker, edgier, more adults things. But I had remembered that, um, that his own, he'd, his, he'd been bereaved at a, at a young age. He'd lost his father as a boy. And also, obscurely, I'd also remember that his mother had been sent to boarding school in, in, in India. And, uh, and so she'd had a sort of Raj childhood. And so the combination you know, made me think, well, perhaps Mark would be interested in this. And, and he'd actually worked with Jack on a very successfully on a television series. So, um, so we, we sent it to him and, and, and we're thrilled that he responded. And so, um, so then that becomes, you know, that becomes the little team, the core. The writer and director, and, and then it, it grows from there. And you, you know, then you begin to, you know, you search for your production designer, your composer, your costume designer, um, and and yeah, we worked we worked very closely together as um, as a creative team. Um, the searching, we went on this long search for you know for the right places for finding oh. our way for finding the gardens. Obviously, I didn't want to force on Mark Munden, um, you know, that the, my my old. Uh, this location which had been such an important part of my childhood but I showed him pictures and he said yeah I'd like to see that and uh, we drove up to Yorkshire because we knew we wanted to film in Yorkshire and uh, to my joy he fell in love with this uh, this place which had been a part of my childhood and uh, and so he was really happy to um, to film to film there and make that the sort of base grounds of Misselthwaite 
Uh, it took us a while to find the exterior. We found the exterior finally in a um, in two places in the Midlands, two ha two different houses which we've sort of used the facades and and placed them somewhere else. Uh, but uh, to create our, our, our gothic mansion of, uh, of Misselthwaite. Um, but yes, yeah, so I, I, what can I say? A producer, um, you know, you very, very often, very often you, you begin with the idea and, and it grows around that. But, but quite often projects, films begin with a writer coming up with the idea or a, or a director, you know, commissioning a writer. In this particular instance, it was, you know, that we, that we make family films often at heyday. It's something we're interested in. And The Secret Garden was always very dear and close to my heart. And um, to, to be honest, we probably would have got to it earlier. But there was always this report that um, Guillermo del Toro was going to make The Secret Garden. Um, but then nothing seemed to be happening. And... And I'd emerged from making a film called Testament of Youth. And it just seemed like, you know, well, where is the secret garden? It's not being made. So why don't we take the plunge and try and make it? Because uh, it's and been, ha is it, has it been 20 years since the last, 27, since the Warner Brothers? 27 years. So <gasps> there's a whole generation that's who right. has, has missed it if they haven't read it. That's, I think for me, yeah. that's the most exciting part about this is, um, you know, some of that generation, their mamas and, and daddies are, you know, they're, they're, they're already kind of <clears throat> past that young age, excuse me. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, to, to get this, this new, you know, last 25 years worth of, of, of kids and, and adults alike. Yeah, that's what I felt. I mean, there have been several versions. Um, mm -hmm. I, I really loved the MGM black and white one, which mm -hmm. was a bit closer to Rebecca and its sort of, you know, ex dark expressionist look. Uh, but I thought that the 93 one had a, had a real beauty to it. But, um, but it still didn't feel to me like a really definitive one had been made. I, I didn't feel it was like remaking The Sound of Music. And right. it, it felt more more like it's you know revisiting a Shakespeare play revisiting the winter's tale and doing a different production of it and for a new generation and yes. and I feel it's just such an enduring story and that it, it doesn't age really the metaphors just ring true for everybody whatever age that you know that that finding you're you know lost in a space and 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 uh you know, a closed heart, letting it open and, and, and heal is tied up with the metaphors of nature and it, 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 never, it never goes away. So, um, but we, we did wonder about, you know, should we make this a um, contemporary story? And that didn't, that didn't quite work. It did feel like, you know, the past needed to be another country still a bit because that whole thing of, Colin locked up in his room and um, and you know it felt it felt like there were there were obstacles to the isolation of the story um, and that the, that didn't feel we could we could bring alive and with any plausibility in today's. yeah yeah um, uh, you've already told us what what brought um, what brought you the most joy within that? Um, what, what are you most grateful for from this experience? Um, I don't know if I have I told you about what what, what brought me the most joy. Um, uh, you did. You said <laughs> watching. You said you said it's watching lovely. others. Um, mm -hmm. And unless you have a different answer, where <laughs> we there can be lots of joy. You don't have to. We don't have to limit the joy. There are many uh, joys. There are many joys. I've talked about. I talked about what a pleasure it was to see how inspired the yes. different collaborators got. That was incredible. They people really yeah. did, um, you know, find their own inner children with this, and and were inspired, and their imaginations came alive. And they had a, you know, they they really enjoyed doing it. I could see that. I think as a whole team, we had an amazing experience going around these gardens. It was just mm. inspiring. We spent five weeks roaming the country. 
it was sunny every day. We, we didn't have any rain. We had this um, heat wave. So we had blissful weather all the time. And the combination of blue skies, amazing gardens, and children and a dog, um, it made for, you know, the whole crew really, really enjoyed it. There was a sort of eternal summer feeling about it, which was oh. a great joy. So that was, that was amazing. Um, um. I remember one particular, I mean, obviously as a producer, it's very stressful depending on the weather. <laughs> um, and uh, I remember one particular day, which is when we were filming the, the, reun the, the scene in which um, Archibald is reunited with his son in the garden. Um, and and it, that, was, that was a scene we shot in this beautiful garden called Eiford Manor um, in, near Bath. And, um, there was Colin Firth already and Eden, his son, already to, and the garden setting just glorious. And, you know, the, the, the nerves and anxiety of will it be a glorious sunny day or won't it be? And I remember us preparing and it was a beautiful weather and, and um, you know, sitting at the side and watching it and just feeling so happy that here we were. And the sun was shining, Colin was there, the kids were there. Um, and, and I remember um, emailing, me, uh, emailing a friend just in the joy of the moment of seeing this glorious scene and everything just going perfectly. <laughs> and that was, uh, that was a happy moment. Uh, uh, oh you know. my goodness. Um, with each project, I'm sure you learned something uh, out of it, some life lessons, some uh, bit of growth of, or personal experience. Uh, did you have anything like that um, come out of this project? Well, um, I suppose, uh, you know, there was, it, one had to be philosophical, always in films, um, you have this pre-production period when uh, when suddenly it turns out you don't have as much money in the budget as you all thought you did and and, uh, and you know you have to work out what to cut and what you can't do and you know there was quite um, there was uh, you know there were su suggestions of should we have less gardens should we you know, consolidate the gardens not go to so many places and part of that was the gamble with the weather and um and the stressful the stress was the well you know it will we can afford this if the weather is good and um and i suppose in a foolhardy way we we did we did go ahead with with all our best laid plans mm -hmm. and just hope for the best with the weather and we thought well if it rains we'll make it work if we you know, we're, we're just, we're just, get, we're just make it work. And, um, and it did work. And so I suppose uh, it was just that trusting, trusting to faith and optimism and deciding to pursue the dream um, and, and, and hope for the best and, and, and trust that we could adjust and adapt and then it, and then it working out fine. That was always, that's a helpful that was a helpful thing to um, to build on because it gives you hope for the future. You think, well, let's let's try, and it'll probably work somehow. Well, and that's for me. That's the the deepest message of the Secret Garden. It's just you know always learning to operate in that hope mode. Um, mm. You know, and you know the garden is the one that shows us. Uh, that, you know, even if it does rain, you know, the flowers will bloom again, even if fall comes, you know, and the, the leaves go away, you know, spring will come again. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's, it's, it's an amazing lesson from the garden. Mm -hmm. um, so I probably, I, probably um, I mean, on a more personal level, I would, um, I would say that, you know, I, 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 I explained that, um, the the story had certain kind of personal resonances for me because you know i was i was a um how do how do we describe it a um a, a socially privileged but but slightly emotionally but more emotionally deprived classic child of my of a certain sector of 
British society, sent off to boarding school, aged eight, uh, very distant relations, uh, relationship from my parents. And, uh, and so it was a very healing experience for me going back to make this film about childhood and, um, and about, um, about trying to understand what had gone on with, with my, own par- you know, my own parents in that time. And in some ways, this is a story about children learning to forgive their parents. Mm-hmm. And so I went through, you know, during the, the whole process of examining this story, you know, when I read it as a child, all I saw was the children. And as an adult, I came back and I saw the children confused and not understanding the griefs of the adults. And um, as I mentioned before, we wove in this extra strand for Mary and her mother. And in the book, Mary's mother just vanishes. And we built in a sense that Mary's, um, that, that, you know, Mary's feckless mother perhaps wasn't feckless, but was perhaps depressed and, and, and withdrawn from her because, because of grief and other reasons. And um, in many ways that actually mirrored, you know, my own having been sent away and, you know, my, my, the, my, my absent mother, that was, that was her own battles that she was fighting. And so it was rather lovely for me to, um, to make a film in which Mary came to make peace with the ghost of her mother. And uh, this, we started making this film probably a year after the death of my mother. Uh, or we started the process of engaging with this. Mm. And, so, and I'd very much made peace with my mother and I'd understood by the end all the, all the things that had stopped her from being present when we were, when we were young. But it was a, a lovely way for, um, it's a lovely story to make, make peace with, uh, with a, a mother who'd been absent in my childhood, but, uh, but, and I hadn't understood at the time. But later, I but later I understood, and I suppose um, you know I would hope that it is a film which um, you know all sorts of children will sit down and watch and and gently have a sense of um, the complexity of adult lives just beyond their vision and understanding, but to try and empathise and and understand uh, adult grief even if they can't do anything about it. I can also, you know, I, the Secret Garden, because of its reach across generations, uh, you know, I imagine the, 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 the daughter and the, the mother and the grandmother all sitting on a couch together and, uh, you know, the, 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 the child having the experience that you just discussed, but then the mother sitting there having that, that aha moment that all mothers do of young children of, oh, this is what my mother must have felt uh, in, you know, in the difficulties of raising a child or whatever it is. And, but being able to see that, you know, being able to look now to that next generation um, with kinder eyes uh, and more empathy and um, more understanding. I, I think uh, what you have, have planted there is, is going to do um, some good healing in, in other in other lives as well. Well, I mean, it's a, com- you know, on the one hand, it is, it is a, a, a story for children, but it's a, certainly a complicated old story full of grief and darkness and, you know, um, Archibald projecting his illness and depression on his son and, and, you know, Mary emotionally damaged by this, you know, difficult relationship with her, with her mother. And um, so there are all these broken people. So it's, it's dark territory for a children's story, really. But then very often children's stories are about, you know, uh, dark stories which have to be overcome. So, um, so that's the essence of this. But um, it, it, what, I, what I love about it is that although it's a story, a children's story, it is also a story about childhood. And so I do hope that there will be lots of adults who, who tune into this sort of lost domain of their childhood and, um, and look back and, and find, find something for themselves. 
Hey friends, I know you're loving my conversation with Rosie, but I wanted to chime in and tell you that she is not only a mom and a talented director, she's also a published writer. Her book, The Very Thought of You, is set in England in the year 1939. The world is on the brink of war. As Hitler prepares to invade Poland, thousands of children are evacuated from London to escape the impending blitz. Torn from her mother, eight-year-old Anna Sands is relocated with other children to a large Yorkshire estate, which has been opened up to evacuees by Thomas and Elizabeth Ashton, an enigmatic, childless couple. Soon, Anna gets drawn into their unraveling relationship, seeing things that are not meant for her eyes, and finding herself part witness and part accomplice to a love affair with unforeseen consequences. It's a story of longing, loss, complicated loyalties, combining a sweeping narrative with subtle psychological observations. The very thought of you is not just a love story, but a story about love. Vogue UK says, it's one of those books you're likely to remember all of your life. And the book pages says, it's for readers of the Orphan Train and Potato Peel Society, um, comes basically not just a story of love, but a story of loss, one whose voice will touch even the coldest of hearts. Search for it today on Amazon or look in the show notes for a direct link. And now let's get back to the rest of our chat with Rosie. I, you know, one hope I have for this is that, you know, I first discovered this when I was eight and I was a, a lonely child. Um, and, and it spoke to me and I want us to have made a film that, that goes, that, you know, has, is, is played and replayed and I hope has a, has a life and that I, I hope, you know, it will reach many children who are sitting on their own, feeling a bit lonely, a bit abandoned, you know, anybody who feels like an outsider, who feels marginalized, who feels emotionally neglected, I feel this is a story that can speak to them and help them and uh, give them hope. And so that's, you know, I, I sort of hope we put it out into the world and it has enough credibility that people keep playing it and then it will naturally reach who it's really meant for, which is, you know, slightly lost, lonely people. I've, I always say that, um, you know, I, I, I try to, um, when, I, when I'm done speaking, I, I always name everyone honorary secret gardeners um, for their role. And, and you are definitely an honorary secret gardener because what you're doing is you are planting seeds in the hearts of these kids that will continue to grow and bloom for a lifetime because here's the the truth is of what you said is that um you know everybody needs a secret garden that they can go to and feel safe and um loved and accepted and uh what i believe francis created in that book was that safe place that story that when things get hard you can crawl up into your imagination into the secret garden and know that there's hope um and 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 uh and a future yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Exactly. Yeah. No, she, she gave everybody something very special to hang on to. Thank you for playing your part in all of this. But thank you. Okay, friends, I'm breaking in again. Not normally my norm, but this was not a normal interview. You're about to hear me wrap up this interview part, but there was so much more that happened before the interview even started that I didn't want you to miss it. But I'm also here to give you a big giant warning. If you have not seen The Secret Garden new movie yet, I would suggest waiting until you see it to come back and listen to the second part of this interview. Not that there are giveaways or spoilers or anything like that. It's just a more intimate conversation about the film and why we love it and behind the scenes things that if you have seen it, it will make a whole lot more sense to you. So I just wanted to give you that big warning. When I wrap this interview up, there is still another 30 minutes of amazing conversation after this. So stay tuned. But if you want to, I would totally suggest watching the movie first. That's it. It has, this has been such a treat. 
to get to hear all of your um, inside scoops, but also just um, uh, the care in which um, uh, you have treated the secret garden um, is fully recognized by me and my family. But um, I do believe that the world um, who loves the secret garden already will also see um, that care with which uh, you took to bring this story to this next generation. So thank you so much. Well, fingers crossed. Uh, you know, we've certainly really tried our best and we love it, uh, you know, and um, we've taken a few liberties, which I hope you will, uh, you will understand. And um, let's hope that, you know, it speaks to, it, you know, there will be people who have, everybody has their own secret garden. We've, we've, we've tried our best, but uh, it's certainly a really beautiful and profound work that uh, deserves to be remembered and retold and kept alive. And so let's hope this uh, film will keep the flame alive uh, for a really beautiful and, and special book. Rosie, thank you so much for sharing your part of the Secret Garden story. Um, thank you everyone who is watching this on YouTube or listening on um, a podcast. And until next time, everybody, blessings and blooms, y'all. And as promised, it is not over. Here is the rest of the interview before the interview even began. Hello, hello. Hello, we meet again. I'm so sorry to interrupt <laughs> you. How are you? I'm great. Truly, do you need more time? This is not I a big deal. I don't at all. Now I'm just longing to hear what you made of the film. Uh, I mean, it's a hard one to ask because, you know, you know the book so well and there are changes and so forth, but were you able to make peace with the adaptation? And um, Oh, there's no peace to be made. Um, uh, I definitely, I, I was walking in with open arms. I have dealt with what you are going to be dealing with a million times over, which is the, I call her the angry book lady. Um, the people who hold so tight onto those words. Um, so I have had to, um, I've had to uh, answer those questions a million times about, you know, aren't you upset about the changes? And, you know, Francis wouldn't have been. Um, Francis knew what it was like to turn a book into a play and then a play into a book again. And she knew that new characters came to the forefront. Um, and so, uh, so I, I have never held um, fast to the secret garden, except for in, of course, the message, right? Um, and uh, what your team has done. I, first of all, I know I will never be able to come up with the appropriate words to tell you how I feel about it, but um, it, it, is, it is the pure essence of the secret garden um, throughout, 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 um, and I think made better. Uh, the, the pieces that you all chose to draw out, um, it, it, uh, it's, it's fantastic. It, I, 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 I will struggle. I, I, there's no way for me to say, um, how pleased I am. And I believe that even the people who have seen the secret garden will love it and, the, or know the secret garden book, like the back of their hands, I believe that they too will fall in love with it. Um, and yeah, the people who have never heard of the secret garden are going to uh, connect with it as well. Oh, I'm so pleased. I'm so pleased because we love it. I mean, we think it's, you know, it's very pure and, um, and, uh, yes, I, I sort of feel you, you can, you know, leave your life behind and enter into this world and, and go on a journey with Mary. And she's pretty amazing that you think young Dixie. Oh. And I mean, the, she's a wonderful actress for letting you inside her soul and the intelligence. Is, and she's brilliant. She's absolutely brilliant. And the, the state of the movie, the way it seamlessly flows from this, um, oh goodness, what would you say? Like um, a dreamy imagination state to flashbacks and then back into reality the movie just like 
undulates there and goes back and forth in this way that um, one moment you feel like you're in a dream, the next minute you're snapped back to reality and um, it's... I'm so pleased you like that. It that never was, stops. That was something we really wanted, uh, uh, the, the real fluidity between the inner and outer worlds and that you're with, it's very much Mary's story from her point of view, but it's a more, I hope, subjective and immersive version um, or, or, you know, adaptation than um, in comparison with some of the earlier versions. So that yeah, you just feel this inner world and her imaginative connection to, to nature around her. And, and um, so yes, memories, dreams, oh, um, yes. glimpses, and, and the sort of concurrent inner world and ghosts of the hauntings, if you like. Um, but but within within the landscape and the house, yeah. But it's, that's what's so great about the story, that it's all there. Yeah, um, I, I I believe that I saw Francis in a new way through Mary, um, and and reflected within this story. It was like there were flashes that I was like. Um, it was, it was uh, almost a more personal version of what I, of who I believe Francis was. Um, within Mary, the, um, that storyteller that is not real, it's not the book, but the way you've drawn it out and made her really that narrator of the story that was there before, but now it's Mary. Um, you know, that was Frances her whole life. She was, she was the narrator of everything that was going on around her. And she absolutely told stories everywhere she went. And her brothers um, really um, disliked it and, and almost bullied her. Um, and anytime she would tell a story, they would kind of put her off. Um, but just, I mean, you imagine having a a, a, a sister who jibber jabbered all the time and told mm -hmm. stories. I mean, just like we probably all did, we'd be like, oh, please be quiet. Um, but I imagine, you know, I saw Mary's face when that boy, you know, told her, you know, oh, those are, you know, basically just silly stories. Yeah, just um, a I, story, yes. <laughs> oh, I, I know Frances felt that her, you know, growing up for sure. Mm -hmm. So there were all these little, like, tiny nuggets that I was like, oh, like, it was, I, you know. Took that a little bit from A Little Princess and the sense that, you know, that she was such a great storyteller, but that was part of Mary as well. It felt that she obviously was a child with imagination and yes. that that was, you know, she's not just a prickly girl, entitled girl. She's sort of redeemed right from the start by the fact that we're moved by her imaginative capabilities. And, um, but that is within the book, you know, there is, there is it moments when so, she's, yeah. you know, but, um, but it's not quite as marked as the little princess, but it felt legitimate as they were both clearly Francis in some way to sort of draw them together. Um, I love it. Oh my goodness. I love, okay. I love that quote. Um, I've written it down. Francis. The between the lines of every story. That's it. I love that. I love that quote. And I, yeah. that was the sort of license we took a little bit, if you don't, you know, the, the, the sense of reading between the lines and finding a few other things. So a very clear example of that really was that we did weave in quite a lot more about Mary's relationship with her mother and obviously in the in the book you know she she's feckless and she dies on the first page whatever and she seems to be uninterested in mary and then she vanishes a bit but i i i felt that there was a there was a sort of a gap there and that there was a space to um explore you know this poor damaged child who's been damaged by feeling emotionally neglected and and you know that very often those upper class mothers who who seem to just um, you know ignore you, they had their own problems, and you just couldn't see it. And so we just wanted to unpack that a little bit and weave that through so that she was able to make peace with the ghost of her mother. So that is an extra thread, really, that we 
brought into the picture, but I hope it was legitimate. Um, oh, I, I loved that part. And I loved, um, I loved the fact that it reminds us all that uh, even our perceptions of reality aren't always the full reality. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Mary and, you know, and Colin both um, were able to better understand their fuller picture by hearing both sides of their their um their parents who were walking through immense grief mm -hmm. um you know yeah. uh, it's oh, it's fascinating story it's so rich the whole story but the the whole idea that these children who make their own little garden of eden without the parents and yet part of it is about them learning to forgive to, the, to break the cycle of family right. groups but also to forgive and understand their parents really too yeah and that grief grief is something that doesn't look the same on everybody um mm -hmm. i think even in this pandemic uh you know we're i'm learning to just be empathetic and and understand that not everybody's dealing with all of this the same. It doesn't, you know, the way you deal with it is different from the way someone else deals with it. And it's, 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 I mean, grief comes in many forms mm. Uh, mm. Mm. and you see it, you see it throughout the book, um, every, every character and, and, the, and the movie that clearly the, every character in the movie is dealing, has, has dealt with grief mm. and, mm. and they're all doing it differently. And it's, it's rather lovely having Colin Firth in the film because he's such an emotional actor and, you know, he can carry a whole hinterland with him of, of, uh, of, of a deep reservoir of feeling. Uh, so although he doesn't appear a huge amount, I hope he has quite a power and a presence in the film. I, I think he does. Uh, it's, it's amazing. I think that's the other thing that I loved and was pleasantly surprised by was that really this film is about the children. Um, I mean, like that it is really centered around uh, those three. Uh, and mm -hmm. at first I longed a little bit for, you know, a Ben the gardener and, a, you know, um, they, they carry it. And the message that pulls out of that, I think, is stronger because it's almost like a distilled down uh, version, if that mm -hmm. makes sense, um, to where you were able to go deeper, it felt, um, into yes. those characters. Yes, uh, yes, I'm sorry, because Ben is a favorite character for many, isn't he? And, uh, uh, yes. We, 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 Yes, we sort of winnowed it down to Mrs. Medlock as a sort of obstacle to the to the garden, and and then and then there is that more radical change that we made, which um, which I don't know how you felt about it. I'm sure it won't be for everyone, but where we where we have the fire, but our our logic was that there's so much um, connective tissue between the Secret Garden and Jane Eyre. And there's so much the sense of, you know, the plucky, clever, plain girl who goes off to the big old house in Yorkshire and meets this broken man, whether it's Archibald or Mr. Rochester. And then the whole place has to kind of burn down to be healed again. And, and there was a sort of a, I don't know, we, we, we felt that maybe there needed an escalation and we drew from, we drew from, we drew from Jane Eyre for that moment uh, to, you know, to have a, uh, a burn down before a rebirth. <laughs> well, I, and, and that's nature. I mean, really, uh, that, that's what happens in nature all the time uh, mm -hmm. is, is, is the burning down before the growth can happen. And um, I, I, f I felt like it felt natural um, mm -hmm. as far as the, oh, the, arc, of, the arc of the story goes and the buildup and the, um, uh, you know, of course, you know, you go, oh, well, that's not, that's not in the film, but then you go, oh yeah, but this is, this is a great way to, to wrap it up and also cause the, the really the, you know, that, that moment of, of clarity for, for um, uh, Archibald uh, mm -hmm. Craven uh, to, to really, you know, snap out of it and go and find those things that are uh, most important to him. And, mm -hmm. He, he does that so <laughs> yes because I suppose we we 
we took a few liberties because in the story, obviously, he, he's off wandering, isn't he? And he hears the call, which I do love. But we just focused, we kept him in the house and we kept the sort of unity of time and place a bit tighter, right. really, to... Um, well, and you did the call, but it was in a way, it was in that ghostly way. So it's, that's what I love is that the essence is all there. It's just done in this, this new way that you haven't, um, you, you, you haven't seen before and it'll stretch your mind and it'll stretch your imagination. And, uh, I, I, I just, I know, I know fans will love it. Um, oh, and I knew that, I know the new fans will love it as well. Um, and, uh, why don't we, we're very excited about the, the, the garden. I mean, some people may prefer the smaller walled garden, but there was something, you know, about getting into this place and it feeling more boundless and wild. And, um, and, you know, you can't quite know where it begins or ends. And, and we did go to all these amazing gardens to... to How many gardens did you end up having to piece together? Um, I, I haven't got a number in my head, but I can quickly, I can quickly list them mentally. So um, Duncan Park, Helmsley Walled Garden, Fountains Abbey, Bodnant Gardens in North Wales, the Forest of Dean in um, Puzzlewood in the Forest of Dean, Iford Manor in Somerset, uh, Tree Bar Gardens in Cornwall, Woodhall Estate in Hertfordshire, um, and then the, the Indian house we, we filmed in a place called Abbotsbury Gardens in um, Dorset. Uh, I, think that's, I think that's all. But anyway, it was a big trek around, you know, oh. every corner of the UK. But, um, but we really wanted to find some inspiring places. And, um, and, and uh, you know, when I'm uh, reading Frances Hodgson Burnett's um, memoir of her childhood and of her the the two houses the house before her father died where there was a beautiful where there was a, a, a beautiful garden and then the the sort of slightly derelict garden that she wandered into she's very much talking about how once you're into this place it feels it feels huge and wondrous and and forever so there was clearly a sense in which she was aware of the subjective power of a childhood's imagination extending a garden and, and creating. Oh, and, and the way you all wove that into, I mean, you wove it into wallpaper, into blankets, into um, uh, when you'll see this, you're just going to, your mind's going to be blown because all of a sudden you'll think something is something and then it'll turn into something else. <laughs> and well, it's just, yeah, oh, we love and then that. you're like, oh, it's the imagination. Yeah, our production designer was um, really um, had such a joyous time, you know, weaving weaving the garden into the wallpaper in the house uh, and and trying to make it all very inwoven, really. Um, that sort of so, you know, when you watch it again, you'll see that there's lots and lots of design details to find there of of what what you don't notice at first that's hidden in the corners of the room, and then you finally because we didn't want it to be one of those houses which um, was just lots of dark panelling. We wanted it to have full of colour and um, and a sense that it had been a joyous place that was sort of dormant and closed down and that gradually more light comes into it and it begins to come more alive until you begin to see that the garden itself is sort of inscribed in the walls. So there's lots of inwoven metaphors in this story which were just a joy to visualise. Oh, it's, uh, it's amazing. I, I really, I cannot wait for people to see this. Um, One of the questions ahead. you asked in the little um, document yeah. was, um, you know, what, what, what was part of the joy of it? And actually, one of the real joys was that I could really see how, um, how it excited, how the story and the world excited and inspired uh, different people. And for example, our lovely costume designer, Michelle Clapton, 
um, when she came to see us, she was so excited. She's, she's a wonderful costume designer who's done the Game of Thrones costumes and won many awards and so forth. But it was just the imaginative quality of the story and that she wanted to create all these costumes which evolved. And yes. so Mary's, you know, moss would start to grow on the coat and, and butterflies would emerge out of a dress and, and flowers would start to to grow out. so so she you know she came up with these evolving costumes so she just you know her team handmade them all and um and it was she was you know she just had such a blissful time um designing mary's costumes and our production designer was was so excited about in you know weaving together all the inner and outer worlds and, and our director and writer obviously as well and, you know, there were just so many people, puppeteers, getting really excited about how we could make, um, how we could make the, the ferns shake and shiver around the river and, and how we could do the puppets and, and the, you know, the cinematographer. They were all just so excited about creating this children's world. And people really had a lot of um, creative joy making this. Oh, and the the way that the foliage and the flowers um, uh, are a part of the humans uh, in the story, and even even the non humans, the 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 animals in the story, uh, like you said, you know the the I noticed the ferns shaking with Colin shaking. Mm -hmm. You know, they were almost like they were taking on the emotion and the pain uh, in a way that is, uh, I mean. I, I don't know who is sitting in a room figuring all this out, but it is, your, your, your mind is going to be blown when you watch it. Everybody in your mind is going to be blown. <laughs> and I do think it is a movie that you um, should watch. And I think that's actually one of the, watch over and over and over again, because you, it is like it's a giant seek and find, um, uh, or a hidden pictures almost uh, of, of sorts, because there are so many things. I've watched it twice now, and the the little details that you notice just add to the mystery and the magic and the, uh, and all of it. Well, I'm so pleased to feel that because it, we, we, we really wanted it to have all these layers and, and, and mystery and, and, and magic and that sense of, um, you know, this, this house full of secrets and mysteries that gradually reveal and, and unfolds. But particularly that just inspiration of um, our relationship with nature. And, um, and you know, it's amazing how few films actually do try and tackle um, immersing us in, in the natural world and showing its inspiration. But, um, but we wanted to have a garden which was responsive and did seem to echo and reflect. Yes. So, you know, our, our inspiration was very much real gardens. Um, we didn't want to make it fake with CGI. So we have used that sparingly and we went to these really, you know, inspiring places. But then we have subtly used, as we say, you know, sometimes we use some puppeteers and sometimes we enhance with, with some visual effects to try and give a sense of nature having a sort of symbiotic relationship with the children and being, being sad when they're sad or, or right. joy when they're, or shivering when they're cold or, you know, and that sort of, um, that, that responsive echoing between between their imagination and the garden around them felt, I, I hope something that hasn't really been done in earlier versions of the secret garden. So, oh. And that no, feels I, very central to Francis's understanding and, and vision of what, what the magic of the, the pantheistic spirit of the garden is. But um, it's, it's, I mean, I could, we could talk about it all day, Laura. And we really could talk about it all day long. But it really is over this time. The podcast is finished. And y'all, I had so much fun talking with Rosie today about the new film. I know that this conversation will make you want to go back and watch the movie again and again because of all the yummy things you may have missed. I want to encourage you, of course, to go see the Secret Garden film. But also, I want you to check out her other work. The Light Between Oceans, Paddington, and The Boy in the Striped Pajamas and her book, of course, The Very Thought of You. And remember, all month long on the podcast, we're featuring interviews with many of those who've helped bring the new Secret Garden movie to life. 
So stay tuned here for next week's episode with Isis David, who plays Martha, the sassy housemate of Misslethwaite Manor. Now make sure that you're following The Well-Tended Life on Instagram and Facebook and subscribe today to our podcast and YouTube channels by the same name so you don't miss a thing. And until next time, y'all, blessings and blooms.